It's that time of year again where you can't escape the flood of ads popping up on your feed. Chocolates, flowers, teddy bears, and hearts, wherever you look. But if you are someone who holds strong beliefs in the teachings of the Holy Bible, you might find yourself conflicted about celebrating Valentine's Day. Is it truly meaningful to dedicate a day to express love? Or is there a deeper, perhaps darker truth about this widely accepted and widely celebrated day that often goes unnoticed? Join us as we delve into the complexities of Valentine's Day and explore how it conflicts with the Holy Bible. I'm Bob Pauline. We'll discuss that and more right here, the Iglesia Ni Cristo International Edition. But first, joining us today in our discussion is Brother Eric Waterman in Quezon City, Philippines, Brother Donald Pinock in Toronto, Canada, as well as Brother Dexter Manglikmut in Washington, D.C. Brothers, thank you for joining us in this important discussion all about Valentine's Day. Brothers, before we delve into the, all of these details about Valenti Valentine's Day, let's share with our viewers this little bit of a concise history and surprisingly, the violent origins of Valentine's Day, which, you know, it really may surprise many. Take a look. Is Valentine's Day really the cutesy holiday we all think it is? History says no. First references to Valentine's Day can be found in the ancient Roman celebration of Lupercalia. However, the celebration isn't the same as you may expect. The February 15th event began with the traditional sacrifice of an unfortunate goat and dog. The Luperci, a group of priests, would then take off a piece of skin from the two animals, touch it to their foreheads, and struck every woman in the area with it. They thought it may help them have more babies. The 5th century came to a close. Pope Gelasius I had enough with the Lupercalia celebrations and introduced St. Valentine's Day in its place. Just like that, February was no longer about sacrifice. It was about love. Around the same time, the Normans started celebrating Galatians Day. Galatian basically meant lover of women. Given their similar pronunciations, it's easy to see how people could have confused that with St. Valentine's Day. And as time went on, the holiday evolved more and more to what we know it has today. So brothers, there's some surprising things recorded in that video. Uh, Brother Bob, if I can jump in, uh, there was some mention about the association between mid-February and romance in a pagan festival known as Lupercalia, likely honoring either Lupa, the she-wolf of Rome who suckled Romulus and Remus, or Faunus, the god of fertility. And it was also mentioned that the festivity began with animal sacrifice, and after that, a ritualistic slapping of young women with strips of the animal skin as well as their blood. And the belief behind doing that was it would cause fertility for the coming year. And I noticed that it was mentioned in the 5th century in an effort to Christianize the pagan festival, Pope Galatius declared February 14th as St. Valentine's Day. All, all of these points are, are, are very interesting and, well, surprising to most of us, right? Brother Donald, I, I want to go back, however, to what you uh, pointed out, what you specifically noticed in, the, in that uh, video clip, it was concerning the Lupercalia. Because ma many of our viewers would uh, maybe want to ask, you know, how's that connected to uh, Valentine's Day that is being celebrated today with the, you know, the chocolates and the cards and the hearts? You know? Can you enlighten us further on the connection to that Lupercalia and Valentine's Day today? Yes, Brother Bob, but if we can take a look first of this video clip that goes into more detail. For all its popularity, history doesn't give us any guarantees as to the origins of Valentine's Day. But we do know it contains vestiges of the early Christian church in ancient Rome. The association between mid-February and romance goes back to a pagan festival known as Lupercalia, likely honoring either Lupa, the she-wolf of Rome, who suckled Romulus and Remus, or Faunus, their god of fertility. The festivities began with an animal sacrifice. Then the ritualistic slapping of young women with strips of the animal's skin and blood to bestow fertility for the coming year. 
In the 5th century, perhaps in an effort to Christianize the pagan festival, Pope Gelasius declared February 14th as St. Valentine's Day. As for the real St. Valentine, there were reportedly several canonized by the church. Legend has it that one St. Valentine, a defiant Roman priest, lived during the 3rd century AD under Emperor Claudius II. Claudius was an ambitious ruler. His battles required vast armies of men to abandon their young families for long periods of time, resulting in a military that was half-hearted and homesick. So determined was Claudius to stop love from sapping the will of his armies, he banned marriages altogether. Father Valentine thought the ban unjust and defied the emperor, continuing to marry young lovers in secret. The emperor eventually caught on to the priest's actions, arrested him, and sentenced him to death. It is believed that young couples he had secretly wed would visit his cell, passing him flowers and notes through the bars as symbols of their gratitude. The story continues that the condemned father Valentine fell in love with his jailer's daughter. On February 14th, the day he was executed, it is said he passed the young girl a note. It was signed, From Your Valentine. A tradition was born. Cupid, the winged matchmaker, started out as the Roman god of love, inspired the image of cherubs for Christians, and is now a favorite of card makers and mass marketers. Dear viewers, it, it has been said that, well, you know, Valentine's Day would not be complete without Cupid, right? Cupid. And that Cupid is the most recognized symbol of love. It's also been said that Cupid, what, uh, what everyone knows of Cupid, right, is he shoots arrows of love, and if it hits you, then you would fall helplessly, hopelessly, madly in love with the next person that you meet. But, Brother Dexter, what can you share with our viewers regarding Cupid? Uh, well, Brother Bob and uh, dear viewers, let me read the following from the website stated below. The mention of Cupid typically conjures up images of a cherubic infant wielding a bow and arrow. But this wasn't always the case. Long before the Romans adopted and renamed him, and way before his association with Valentine's Day, Cupid was known to the Greeks as Eros, the handsome god of love. Armed with a bow and a quiver filled with both golden arrows to arouse desire and leaden arrows to ignite aversion, Eros struck at the hearts of gods and mortals and played with their emotions. In one story from ancient Greek mythology, which was later retold by Roman authors, Cupid or Eros shot a golden arrow at Apollo, who fell madly in love with the nymph Daphne, but then launched a leaden arrow at Daphne so she would be repulsed by him. Also, Brother Dexter and dear viewers, in the same reference on history.com, we can see the origin of the iconic Valentine's Day figure, Cupid. It says there, the poetry of the archaic period, Eros was represented as a studly immortal who was irresistible to both men and gods. But the Hellenistic period, he was increasingly portrayed as a playful, mischievous child. Because of his associations with love, in the 19th century Victorians, they credited with popularizing the Valentine's Day and giving the holiday its romantic spin, began depicting this cherubic version of Cupid on Valentine's Day, cards and a trend that has persisted until this day. So Brother Eric and dear friends, Cupid is not some innocent, cute, angelic being as what is being promoted and imagined by others to be. Even though, first we have to understand, this is a fictional character, something that was made up. And for those who made it up, he was recognized as being their god of love. But he was also portrayed as a very mischievous child. That being, that being the case, brothers, and now that we've talked about uh, paganism and the uh, uh, pagan uh, connections to some of the things that are taking place and believed in regarding Valentine's Day, some of these dark truths, if you will, about Valentine's Day. 
It only begs the question then, well, how then did it become so popular today? And why has it become so mainstream despite such dark history and the dark truths of its past? Take a look at this video. Our modern Valentine's Day, removed from its religious and pagan past, has evolved into one of the most celebrated holidays on the calendar. On average, Americans shower their loved ones with 180 million roses, red ones naturally, and almost 36 million heart-shaped boxes of candy, not to mention all those cards, dinners, and diamonds. All told, the holiday brings in almost $14 billion annually, giving retailers plenty to love as well. But if you're worried that you can't afford to treat your loved one properly next Valentine's Day, take heart. The poets were right. Love is really all you need. Dear viewers, all of this goes to show that the history of what is recognized nowadays as Valentine's Day is saturated in pagan practices customs, and false gods, but also has become a commercial event that so many are profiting from. It sure is, Brother Donald. The chocolates and cards and all these things, no doubt about that. It's very, very commercial. A lot of people making a lot of, uh, uh, lot, lot of income off it. So uh, some of our viewers, though, uh, brothers, m might be wanting to say this, that they, for example, believe in Christ, and they don't want to be part of any pagan practices, the dark history of such uh, pagan traditions. And maybe they would say, well, where does that leave me now? I'm really conflicted about celebrating Valentine's Day then because I want to celebrate, I, I want to celebrate those that I love. I want to send them chocolates. I want to send them cards. I want to say happy Valentine's Day. I, I want to do this. I want to do that. So they're very conflicted and ask, what then should they do? Dear viewers, if you're posing that question as well, stay with us. That's what we're going to pick up right after this short break. Welcome back everyone. Today, we're talking about the truth about Valentine's Day. In the first part of our program, we were discussing and learned that, well, Valentine's Day, which, as we all know, being it's being celebrated by so many people now around the world, actually has its roots firmly entrenched in pagan gods and traditions. Sad to say, many people are oblivious to that fact, however. You know, they continue to observe this annual custom and you know, not to mention the great commercial revenue that it brings worldwide, as we mentioned with, with the cards and, and candies and all such gifts and such that are passed around on Valentine's Day. But should those who believe in Christ and believe in the Bible, should we go along and celebrate this pagan holiday? In short, should true Christians celebrate Valentine's Day or not? But they're done. And the answer is an adamant no. That's a pretty emphatic answer, and you didn't hesitate at all there, uh, Brother Donald. Why not? Why such an emphatic no to Valentine's Day? Well, primarily because of the true God's prohibition concerning the worshiping of false gods. And we can actually read that here in Exodus 20, and the verses are three to five. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So, dear viewers, the true God strictly forbids the making or worship of graven images or other so-called gods. Those who do so will be punished by the one and only true God. Sadly, those who observe and involve themselves in Valentine's Day activities are essentially worshiping false gods, 
since the roots of this celebration include the likes of Pan, who is Lepercus, and Eros, or Cupid, which is another name for Amor. Those are different names of false gods and the acts that they did. These are all abominable before our Lord God, and any tradition that includes the worship or even the recognition of false gods well, should not be practiced by true Christians. I think most um, would agree to that, uh, Brother Dexter. But you know, some might also be saying something maybe along these lines. He said, maybe they're thinking, look, you, you, you're just taking this way too seriously. Valentine's Day is just for fun. A time when people are really just enjoying themselves. Like I've been saying a few times already, that's the day they, they, they make heart-shaped chocolates and send to people. It's, it's, it's now secular. It's no longer considered pagan, they would say, uh, by a modern society. It would no longer make, it, make that connection. So what's the big deal, many would say? Well, Brother Bob, the big deal is, is that we're, we're Christians. We're not following the society or the majority opinion or traditions of man. But rather, what we follow is what the Bible teaches us. And this is what we can read here in the New American Bible in Ephesians chapter 4, the verses 17, 18, and verse 20. I declare and solemnly attest in the Lord that you must live no longer as the pagans do. Their minds empty, their understanding darkened. They are estranged from a life in God because of their ignorance and their resistance. That is not what you learned when you learned Christ. So the Christians were warned not to live as pagan people do. In other words, don't follow the traditions or pagan practices that we find in the world. And let's be reminded, you can't Christianize what is pagan according to the teaching of the Bible. Why? Paganism is different. But, but, but wait, wait, Brother Eric. That's, you, you make a very good point there. But I know that uh, many of our viewers would simply want to say, why not? If paganism is, is so wrong and paganism and, 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 and the practices of paganism is, 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 should not be done, why can't... Why can't something that is pagan be Christianized? What, what's, what would be wrong with that? It was already mentioned earlier in our program that we really are Bible-based. And that is why the answer will come from the Bible. Here in 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 10, and the verses are 6 to 7. These events happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. For the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged themselves in pagan revelry. God's first nation, ancient Israel, committed a great evil, or meaning to say they sinned against God by following pagan traditions and worshiping idols. And this is also what happened to the first century church of Christ, because she was led away from the true faith or was apostatized because of the introduction of false teachings and idol worship, as well as adopting to many pagan traditions. This is why the administration of the Church of Christ at this time period, which the Bible calls as the ends of the earth, clearly informs the members and also those who are willing to accept the biblical truth that involving or participating in such traditions is unacceptable. In fact, an abomination before the true and the almighty God. Now, when it comes to love, well, we have nothing against love because God is love, according to 1 John 4, 16. However, what we are against is paganism because the Bible is against paganism. It's nice, Brother Donald, that you, you, you stressed there that uh, we're not against love, which is, again, where perhaps others would jump in and argue, uh, saying things like, that's what we're expressing. 
Okay, God is love, like what you just said, that you just read that, Brother Donald. That's what we're doing with Valentine's Day. We're expressing our love for our boyfriend, our love for our girlfriend, our love for our fiance, our love for our wife, our husband, or whomsoever, or even someone we like. We're just taking the opportunity offered to us on Valentine's Day to let them know how we feel about that person. Is it wrong? To love? Well, Brother Bob, uh, it's definitely not wrong to love. But uh, the thing that you pose, that argument that many people make, well, it's very common. What they don't understand, though, as they try to celebrate this Valentine's Day, is who above everyone else should we love? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ teaches the following, as recorded here in the book of Matthew. The chapter is 22. The verses are 36 to 39. This is what the Savior says. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught, dear friends, which is the first and greatest commandment, and that is to love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. So dear friends and viewers, our Lord Jesus Christ also mentioned in that verse the second greatest commandment, and that was to love our neighbor or those around us as we love ourselves. And this is exactly what we strive to do inside the Church of Christ by presenting to you these truths that are written in the Holy Scriptures, not only to express our love to you, but more so that you will show your love to God properly and not be misled or misguided by any traditions or practices that go against His teachings. Well, then, according to the Bible, how can, how can a person prove that they, that they love God? Okay, how, how does, how does what any of our viewers uh, prove that they are someone who loves God and would be willing to uh, do all that was necessary to prove to God that they love Him? Excellent question, Brother Bob, but let's not base it on our opinion, but let's read what the Bible teaches is the definition of the way God wants our love to be expressed to Him. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So how are we able to prove to the one and only true God that we love Him and only Him? It is by following and keeping and obeying His commandments, not following traditions or practices that the majority of society might be following. Why? What is one of the commandments that God said should be recognized? Earlier, it said that we should not worship, observe, or recognize or venerate other gods, even if they are false gods veiled behind nowadays what seems to be a harmless tradition celebration, or observance. And so, if we're conflicted about celebrating Valentine's Day because we want so badly to also celebrate those that are around us that we truly love, the first one that we need to proclaim our love to is our almighty Lord God, the one and only true God. And if we really want to please our almighty Lord God, let's follow what's follow in the Bible, the commandments of God, that we cannot be celebrating holidays that are rooted in pagan practices. Dear friends and viewers, we can't do both. You can't follow God and go along with the world or the festivals and traditions of men like celebrating Valentine's Day. Dear viewers, this is only one of many biblical truths that the Church of Christ wants to proclaim to you. That is why we extend an open invitation for you to attend a Bible study, a worship service, any church activity at a congregation of the Church of Christ nearest to your home. 
because as idiomatic as it may sound, these biblical truths will set you free from any falsehood concerning acceptable worship and service to the true God, and above all else, when it comes to being assured of salvation and the attainment of eternal life. Thank you very much, brothers, for the uh, important insight on Valentine's Day. I'm sure all our viewers have gained much from all that you have shared in this important uh, conversation about Valentine's Day. But dear friends, that, uh, that does it for us uh, to, uh, today on this program, Iglesia Ni Cristo International Edition. We'd like to thank Brother uh, Eric Waterman in uh, Quezon City, Philippines, as well as Brother Donald Pinock in Toronto, Canada, and in our Washington, D.C. studios, uh, Brother Dexter Manglikmot. Uh, brothers, thank you all for providing to us, giving us Bible-based answers so that, as the Apostle Peter said to the members of the church, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. That's 1 Peter 3.15. We hope you'll join us again next time. I'm Brother Bob Pauline, and thanks for watching. Before we go, we'd like to again invite you to join us for a short closing prayer. Our dear God, our merciful Father in heaven. Yes, Father. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Yes, Father. You have allowed us to be guided in another episode of this program we give all the praise and honor back unto your holy name. Amen. We thank you also for this message that we have received, that we were able to share with our friends and our loved ones who are watching this program. Yes, Father. May you please bless all of us and let our friends and our loved ones understand we share this message out of love for everyone yes, Father. because it is your desire that everyone comes to the knowledge of the truth that will lead them to salvation. Amen. We ask you, please bless our friends and our loved ones who heard this message. Grant unto them the guidance of your Holy Spirit so that they may decide, they may continue listening to your teachings. And if it is your will, we may be together inside the Iglesia Ni Cristo Church of Christ, giving honor and praise unto your holy name. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, continue to bring all of our prayers unto our Father. Please give us also the good qualities that we need, a submissive and humble heart, so that we may be like you and fulfill the Father's will in our life. Dear God, as we return unto you now in this prayer, we are confident you have listened to our supplication. You have blessed the church in its entirety through the leadership of the church administration, and you will continue to bless and uphold our beloved executive minister. Amen. We pray all of these things through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.